Welcome everyone and thank you for joining our program with our guest speaker, Professor Katie Ku from uh, Pace University. Um, so our program is sponsored by the University of Houston Law Center, the European Commission through the H2020 and Mercury Actions and uh, by the um, Environment, Energy and Natural Resources Center at the University of Houston Law Center. Uh, so, for your information, next month we are thrilled to have another guest speaker, and that will be uh, Professor Sheila Foster from George Georgetown Law uh, on May the 25th. Um, for further information, please visit our, our website, www.law.uh.edu slash inner center, where you will find the uh, uh, um, information about the upcoming events in the series and freely access uh, the open archive of the program. Uh, feel free to use the chat box for your questions and uh, in due course we will display the CLE credits uh, of this program. Uh, from now on I'll turn it over to Professor Tracy Hester, co-director of the Inner Center and our chair uh, this afternoon. Hello everyone and welcome. It's a pleasure to see you. Uh, I'm Tracy Hester and uh, thank you Alban for introducing uh, the program and producing me. I'm a co-director with the Environment, Energy and Natural Resource Center here at the University of Houston Law Center, along with my professor, co-professors, uh, Professor Gina Warren and Professor Victor Flatt. Uh, we've been doing this series over the course of the past now, getting close to two years of it's hard to believe. And we've been blessed to have an extraordinary series of speakers participate with us. Uh, just, of course, a brief uh, sponsor's message. Uh, the in University of Houston Environment, Energy, and Natural Resource Center is a center set up to study legal issues at the intersection of energy and environmental law, which takes advantage of our location uh, here at the energy capital of the United States. Uh, we are obviously keenly interested in issues related to the energy transition, energy justice, and climate change responsibility and liability. So obviously our discussion today is uh, squarely in that zone of interest. Uh, the other thing I get to do is introduce friends and colleagues, and it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Katie today. Uh, Professor Ku is the Hobb Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law at Elizabeth Hobbs School of Law at Pace University. Uh, she has also previously been a professor with Hofstra and an associate in private practice. She brings both worlds to our discussion today. Uh, she is a graduate from Yale Law School and also Yale University, so she's a double Yaley, so no jokes about Yale today. The other thing is uh, she deserves special credit today. Uh, she's well known to all of us. I think there's one of the reasons that we've got such a high number of attendees today. It's a, a, a reflection on her. But it also, I think we should give honor to her sacrifice. She's speaking to us from Hawaii today. So any day spent on a webinar with us is a day away from the beaches, which we very much appreciate your time. So with that, Professor Ku, the microphone is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I will say just to acknowledge the work, Tracy, Fred, that you and everyone at the University of Houston Law Center has done. This speaker series has been so valuable. It's become one of my favorite go-to series. You've gotten a really extraordinary range of both speakers and um, at attendees. Uh, and I also want to um, acknowledge and thank the William S. Richardson School of Law where I'm visiting uh, visiting this um, this semester. It's been um, a wonderful a wonderful place to be. Uh, and also thank everyone for being here. I'm gonna share my screen and start my presentation, but before I do, I would really underline to you all, I'm presenting to you a chapter on which edits are due soon and I'm stuck. And I am counting on our questions and discussions today to help me get unstuck. Um, so with that, let me share my screen and get, and get started. Okay, so hopefully, hopefully everyone is is seeing uh, is seeing the PowerPoint. Um, so a little bit of, of background on this project. Um, this project is meant to be is uh, planned to become a chapter in a book um, that the Environmental Law Institute will be publishing. It is the product of the proceedings of a group called the Environmental Law Collaborative. The Environmental Law Collaborative was started by Jesse Ali and Keith Hirakawa. Um, 
over a decade ago now, I think. And basically, it brings together a group of law professors every two years. And it's a somewhat unusual get together in the sense that um, the format is that typically when law professors get together, we all come with an idea for a project and we present it to one another and we, and we talk about it. This is a little bit a little bit different in that the um, collaborative authors basically kind of look around and see what's going on in the environmental law field, pick a kind of a topic to center discussions, and then we just sit around and talk about it <laughs> um, for two days. And it typically produces a book um, at the end, depending, you know, that kind of reflects where um, our discussions led different, what led different people um, to focus on. So, um, in the summer of 2021, the Environmental Law Collaborative got together and we focused our discussions around um, a really compelling and interesting, frankly disturbing article written by two of our members, Jay Brule and Robin Craig, titled Four Degrees C. And um, I think that it's since been published in the Minnesota Law Review and in addition, I think was recognized um, maybe by the Environmental Law Policy and Annual Review as one of the best law review articles um, of the year. Um, but the, the idea behind the article um, is that um, professors Craig and Rule looked around and said a lot of our adaptation planning in the United States, it, it's almost exclusively focused on planning for one and a half to two degrees of warming. And if you look at um, kind of projections about where we might be headed and you're a remotely cautious person, you would cognize the possibility that we will have um, significantly, experience significantly higher warming than one and a half to, do, to two degrees. And, and therefore this idea that we're undertaking all of these adaptation, um, all this thinking about adaptation without cognizing the real possibility and risk of higher level warming seems short-sighted, particularly for a group of lawyers who are, who are trained to think about worst case scenarios and be, and be somewhat cautious. Um, so that formed the basis for our discussion was really thinking about um, what does adaptation, how do we prepare law policy and um, law and policy to prepare society um, for significantly higher levels of warming than the one and a half um, or two degrees um, that you know, we're, we're hopeful um, to, um, to limit warming to, but I think none of us are particularly optimistic or um, confident about. Um, as an aside, um, if that's something that interests you, um, many of the members of the Environmental Law Collaborative are actually getting together tomorrow at the University of Iowa. The Hubble Law Initiative there is sponsoring a conference. It's going to be virtual, um, and I've included a link on this slide. Um, that you can take a look at it where, um, you know, my chapter focuses on one slice of thinking about adaptation to higher level, um, higher level warming, but authors went in tons of different directions. So if that's something that's interesting to you, that's happening, uh, that's happening uh, tomorrow. Um, if you have a question mark um, in your head about, wow, um, haven't we just seen some great projections suggesting um, but some of the worst case scenarios with respect to warming are less, less likely than we um, had feared. Um, and that in fact, if you look at um, uh, even existing policies, you've got, this is um, carbon, carbon action tracker um, that suggests that, you know, if you look at our current just implementation of current policies, we're, you know, maybe headed for 2.7 degrees um, warming, but gosh, we've got all of these um, additional pledges and targets and um, proposals that um, uh, different uh, states have, um, have adopted. And if we factor those in, um, it seems like, wow, e even though we're, we're not at 1.5 C, we're certainly, this isn't looking like four degrees, right? Um, and I, and I think that's that's fair to recognize. I think it uh, doesn't make any, it, it, those of us uh, in the environmental law collaborative less, um, it doesn't make us sanguine about just assuming that we should be comfortable indexing adaptation to one and a half or two degrees. And I'll talk about, um, talk about some of the reasons, um, some of the reasons why. So if you think about, um, some of the room for error in those kinds of um, projections. First of all, there, there's a significant amount of uncertainty still or ranges with respect to 
what volume of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere leads to how much warming. Uh, but there's also really significant uncertainty about um, what volume of greenhouse gases we can anticipate. And this is a product both of um, a lot of complexity with respect to things like tipping points and feedback loops. So in other words, as the um, climate warms, there are natural changes that may occur that may lead to significant um, emissions of um, greenhouse gases. And to give you a, a for example, I think just yesterday, it may have been Nature Climate published a finding that methane emissions from wetlands have risen faster this century than in even the most pessimistic uh, climate scenarios. So to give you a sense of one of these kind of tipping points and feedback loops, um, permafrost wetlands um, are partially frozen as the climate warms and the permafrost thaws. Uh, dormant microbes can start to wake up and that releases methane. At the same time, um, as, as a result of um, changing rainfall patterns um, in tropical areas, we're starting to see some changes in the distribution of tropical wetlands, both of which are, appear to be contributing um, to increases in wetland um, emissions, something that they call wetland methane feedback, um, to the point where um, the authors of this study uh, found that over the past 20 years, wetland methane emissions um, have risen faster than the projections under even the most pessimistic emission scenarios, the RCP um, uh, 8.5. 8 and this is something that um, professors Rule and Cray talk about in their um, article, that if you, if you look at kind of manifested on the ground, kind of um, how with our current level of warming, what is the on the ground experience? Um, time and time again, you're seeing the impacts, on the ground impacts, um, feeling uh, more, being more severe um, than um, perhaps um, had been projected. So again, another point of uncertainty. So we have a lot of uncertainty um, related to the potential for tipping points and feedbacks that will cause big spikes or higher emissions than we're anticipating. But we also have a lot of uncertainty about if we have a given level of warming, what does that feel like on the ground or how does it manifest, um, manifest on the ground? And some inkling that it even, we're seeing things now that scientists did not predict would occur until higher levels, much higher levels of warming, which is all my way of saying it may be that that the impacts <laughs> that we thought we might have at four degrees are actually um, the types of impacts we might be seeing at much lower levels of warming, two and a half degrees, um, uh, et cetera. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, if you have that sensation of every time you turn around, there's a new headline, um, unprecedented heat, unprecedented um, temperatures in the global ocean, et cetera. Um, NOAA has a, a nice page where they have started kind of putting some of this pen to paper so that you're not imagining it right. There are um, significant climate um, uh, anomalies occurring. Um, so this is all my way of, of saying that despite kind of the recent flurry of, oh, maybe, maybe the worst case scenarios are less likely than we thought, um, and wow, if we can just implement these policies that have been announced, maybe we, we're, we're getting closer to that two and a half, two and a half degree range. I think there um, it, it, nonetheless would not be prudent um, to uh, assume or be confident that we will um, keep warming to one and a half to two to two degrees. And, and finally, one last point point of slippage I would mention is that I think um, particularly as lawyers and practitioners, we can all understand um, that while we tend to greet the adoption of climate laws with great fanfare and wow, we did it, um, it's actually just the beginning, right? And implementation um, is can be a whole other kettle of fish. So assuming that all of the adopted or announced uh, targets or policies will actually be implemented effectively is again, uh, another significant leap um, leap of faith. Uh, so what was my motivation for this project? So my motivation for this project um, was to think about um, in their article, Professors Rule and Craig document or identify um, some of the significant impacts of higher level, higher level warming, which are really dislocating, right? Put enormous strains on society, um, including most in particular in the United States, um, really significant internal mm -hmm. 
um, internal migration. And you know, the sense, my sense here is that under high level warming, where we're experiencing kind of extraordinary societal strain, um, thinking about justice in that context becomes even more difficult because of the potential, real potential, um, for that societal strain to amplify pre-existing inequality. Um, and so two other, you know, chapter authors in the book, uh, Cinnamon Karlarni and Keith Harakawa, um, have talked about this and, and have a great kind of way of thinking about it, which is to say that, quote, disaster streams along existing pathways of inequality, deepening those inequalities as it, um, as it flows. And, it, you know, I, I think we can look at some historical examples that suggest the extent to which when society is understrained, justice tends to sometimes be the first thing we let go or tends to be um, uh, easy to jettison. So what I've given you a picture of here is the 1927 dynamiting of a levy um, in Louisiana. Um, the levy was um, uh, dynamited to ease flooding in New Orleans, um, the result was to flood four largely Black communities south of New Orleans. There's been a fair amount of work, in particular um, post-Katrina, that suggests that even um, post-disaster, um, it's not uncommon for environmental justice communities to end up being saddled with hosting debris landfills and other locally undesirable uh, land uses related to cleanup uh, and rebuilding efforts. Um, but more generally, I think thinking about, um, if you think about the um, problems society will be dealing with at higher level warming, I think of it almost in terms of government having to run to stand still. So if we go from having kind of um, being a, a generally stable society punctuated by periods of um, natural disaster, um, to experiencing kind of almost a constant, a constant state um, of managing um, unusual and disaster-like events and pressures on food supply systems and pressures on availability of water and internal migration. Um, I think there we could all kind of intuitively sense um, that in the words of another co-author to the book, um, we might start to see justice as quote, a luxury that requires, requires letting go. Um, and so I guess that the motivation for this chapter was really to try to think about what can we do now in our law and policy in anticipation, knowing um, that these impacts will arise, understanding the incredible, the real potential um, for kind of justice to be at the bottom of the list when we're thinking about, do we get the power back on? Do we get the lights back going? Um, what is the urgency of mitigation, um, uh, et cetera? And in thinking about that, um, I, I realized there were two, two kind of ways that, that were shaping my framing or thinking about this issue. So the first is um, I was I borrowed a concept from Richard Lazarus, who in an article um, in 2009, I will say written kind of the article was written with the idea of, oh, we're on we're about to adopt federal climate mitigation policy. Um, and what we need to be, and of course we didn't, right? And he did write a follow-up to this article about the fact that we didn't, but we're about to adopt federal climate mitigation policy. And Professor Lazarus's concern was um, we should be thinking about ways to ensure that when we adopt um, emission reduction targets and, and goals and policies, that we um, make it hard to undo them when the rubber hits the road and they get uncomfortable, expensive, and difficult to implement. And so he and he talked about how uh, talked about it as kind of a, a pre-commitment. How can you design law and policy to make it harder to undo, to bind yourself in the future in a way, to make it harder to undo um, when um, you start to see on the ground trade-offs to implement, implement the policy. Um, and the other piece of framing I think I had in mind was the fact that we have so long 
um, suffered from the lack of a really robust legal anchor for the implementation of environmental justice in the United States. And so I've listed here executive order 12898, I think adopted in 1994 under the Clinton administration, which has um, for a very long time basically been at least at the at the federal level the legal anchor for environmental um, the implementation of environmental justice measures and it's of course it's an executive order um, and there have been um, office of inspector general and GAO reports lamenting its um, really spotty implementation in some sense um, I'm struck that despite the fact that it's just an executive order, and we've certainly had a lot of changes in administration, administrations that were perhaps not as receptive to the concept of environmental justice, it has endured in that sense, it's still there, but definitely its implementation has um, certainly waxed and waned um, over, uh, over the years. So um, what I was started to think about is, um, if we're trying to prepare law and policy now for impacts we know are coming that are going to cause this incredible societal kind of dislocation and strain, and we also know embedded within that is the potential to exacerbate in, um, inequality, um, how can we pre-commit ourselves now to protect justice in the future when it gets really tempting um, to make decisions that undercut justice in service of needs which at the time will seem more pressing? And there were three concepts that I that I kind of started thinking about as um, maybe ways to design a pre uh, a pre commitment to justice. The first was to think about well, how do we make um, our law and policy enduring or sticky, um, and how do we make it kind of frankly harder harder to undo, harder to renege, um, make it um, kind of. Um, in a sense, binding, uh, binding in a way, but but less likely to um, uh, harder to trade off in the moment, right? And the second piece was thinking about, and maybe part of that is how can we make justice measures to protect justice that we put in law and policy today um, automatic. In other words, not dependent on the exercise of balancing or discretion or judgment calls on the ground where um, there might be a real possibility for, um, for slippage. Um, and finally, it seemed to me that it might be really important um, to make sure that these pre-commitments to justice be early. In other words, that they be um, embedded in law now um, so that we're making these decisions and thinking about um, valuing justice at a moment uh, in the cool of now as opposed to the heat of later. Um, and that might be somewhat um, somewhat uh, protective. So to look at this, um, I thought, well, why don't I take a look at um, some existing state climate law and policy um, and see what's happening with respect to the incorporation of or efforts to protect justice in climate law and policy. And just take a, take a step back here. Um, I, I would say I, I chose to focus on um, climate law and policy primarily because it's an area of significant and rapid lawmaking. There's an obvious nexus to climate change. And in many of the states where um, climate law and policy is developing rapidly, there is a real concern for and attention um, uh, to justice. So there, there does seem to be a desire and an effort um, to implement climate policy that considers justice implications. Um, I will say I, I harbor no illusion um, it, it that, um, that finding ways to um, recognize and protect justice in climate policy is in any way sufficient to prepare for the kind of societal dislocation that um, higher level warming would bring. And in, in that sense, you know, you were talking more <laughs> about, um, you might think um, an alternate approach might be to do everything we can today to improve day-to-day -day equity, to improve, um, minimize existing inequality driven um, uh, by um, systemic uh, discrimination, colonialism, et cetera. 
um, to kind of just reduce the inequality going into the really um, severe um, severe period. And, and so to some extent, um, because these climate laws are largely existing, speaking to or operate within existing law and policy frameworks, they're kind of on the margins, right? They're not radical, deeper change that is really going to address underlying and deeper inequality in society, which may ultimately um, may ultimately be more effective um, and necessary. Um, however, it, I do think making sure that um, these, you know, to the extent we're including provisions designed to protect justice, doing it in a way that's going to be effective, particularly if we experience um, warming that is much higher than we, um, that, or, or effects, on the ground effects that are, um, quite difficult um, is important because um, I'm concerned that if we're, what we're effectively doing is saying, yes, um, protecting justice in the face of climate change is important to us. And we are um, manifesting that through measures that turn out to not be very effective. Essentially what's that, what that is doing is making us feel better right now. <laughs> not achieving a lot later and creating a real opportunity cost in terms of um, directing our attention away from avenues that might be more uh, more effective. So, um, so I, I looked primarily at New York and Massachusetts. So New York's flagship um, climate law is the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And I did find some provisions in it that I think probably satisfy most of the criteria that I've been thinking about as constituting a pre uh, a pre-commitment. Um, so, um, one example of these is that meet the statute provides that disadvantaged communities should receive no less than 35% of the overall benefits of spending on clean energy and energy efficient uh, programs. Um, in terms of enduring this, that is, a, that is a command that's in the statute. So, when I think about what do I mean by enduring, um, Although I think it's a complicated question, but generally having a command in a statute is probably going to be more enduring than having it in an executive order, right? I think regulations also have the potential to be enduring and sticky, but maybe not as much as a, as, as a statute. Um, it's a, probably worth some more kind of um, examination of what actually makes law sticky, but my general hierarchy was better to be in a statute than in regulation and better to be in a regulation than an executive, um, than an executive order or agency, uh, or agency uh, guidance. So it's, it's a statutory um, command, which to my mind kind of checks the box for being at least relatively, um, relatively enduring. It's also very clear, right? It, and it's, it speaks to, okay, part of Justice is the um, equitable kind of distribution of environmental benefits. Um, and it, it's very clear that 35% um, number seems relatively automatic to me. So again, ticking that box. Um, and in terms of early, I like the fact that yes, it is early. We're adopting, this is New York's flagship climate statute and embedded in it is this um, uh, right now, we're gonna say as we move forward to implement all of these policies, um, that we're going to require, make sure we're monitoring where, where are these funds flowing. Um, and so to my mind, it, it ticked all of those boxes. Um, another aspect of the law that, that I thought looked quite like a pre-commitment um, is that um, the statute also provides that in developing regulations um, to implement greenhouse gas emission reductions, there's an explicit command to make sure um, that those regulations don't end up increasing uh, co-pollutants or pollutants that are often that are emitted in conjunction with greenhouse gases um, uh, and doesn't result in a, in a net increase in those, in those co-pollutants. From a justice perspective, I think this is obviously important because facilities that produce greenhouse gases and, and their co-pollutants tend to be disproportionately located in environmental justice communities. Um, and this requirement could therefore help to avoid a situation where climate mitigation measures exacerbate existing injustice by exposing those populations to even more non-greenhouse gas um, pollutions. Again, it's in the statute, so to my mind, ticks the box for enduring. In terms of automaticity, 
Um, although obviously there's going to be some um, interpretation around how do you define that increase, how do you define community, et cetera. Again, it seems like a pretty automatic and clear statutory command, not a ton of discretion left um, to kind of um, finesse it uh, down the line. And again, early in the sense that it's before these um, provisions are being adopted. Um, I did find kind of, you know, there are some parts of the act that read more like a general exhortation. So I'd identify, call, you know, specifically this type of exhortation. Um, there's an, you know, the statute says that a firm should prioritize measures to maximize net reductions of greenhouse gas emissions in disadvantaged communities. That's great. It doesn't, it, it is in the statute, um, but to my mind, it's not particularly automatic in the sense that I think the charge to the agency is sufficiently malleable, um, that it doesn't create a really odd, um, clear, uh, a really clear command. So I probably wouldn't say that this is, um, this is a, a good example of a pre-commitment. Uh, turning to Massachusetts, um, so um, Massachusetts has, um, adopted a series of climate laws. There's some interesting and nice development over time to see more incorporation of an attention to um, justice. However, I think taking a, a step back, my sense of where it is now is that the statute, um, the climate laws in Massachusetts have some very broad statutory demands that leave a lot of room for discretion and implementation. There's a regulatory process underway to start interpreting and get, kind of putting flesh on the bones of the statutory commands. Um, and I think it remains to be seen how robust those regulatory protections will end up being. Um, so to give a specific, um, a specific example, Massachusetts law requires the preparation of roadmap plans for how the state will meet um, its emission reduction, the emission reduction limits it has bound itself to. Um, in 2021, Massachusetts amended um, its uh, Global Warming Solutions Act that requires the production of those plans um, to require um, that and, and added some uh, justice provisions. Um, so the roadmap plans now have to summarize um, steps taken uh, to improve or mitigate economic, environmental, and public health impacts on lower moderate uh, income uh, individuals. Um, and also, um, the, there is a direction um, to the Energy and Environmental Affairs Secretary to develop rules to meet emission limits that achieve them equitably and in a manner that protects low and moderate income persons. Um, again, I think this is probably not a pre-commitment. Why? Well, it is enduring in the sense that it's text in the statute. It's not particularly automatic in the sense that the charge is quite, um, uh, is quite broad. Um, to give you a kind of a contradistinction of some aspects of the law that I think more or better resemble a pre-commitment, um, there is a provision in the statute um, that sets out, and it, it sets out, doesn't just set out a minimum amount of funding, it actually identifies a forward-going funding source to direct money um, to a clean energy equity uh, workforce and market development program. Um, to my mind, that's in the statute. Um, it's an automatic, very clear command, um, and it's early. It's right at the start of these programs. We're setting out these new policies for how we're going to mitigate climate change. And by the way, we're going to make sure that the benefits of doing so are equitably distributed. So that, to my mind, um, looks like a pre-commitment. Um, I'd also flag that Massachusetts has simultaneously significantly um, changed its environmental review processes to um, be much more explicit in terms of what is required to be considered with respect to impacts on environmental environmental justice um, in ways that I think will be probably provide like this buttress support on the outside for um, the effective deployment of all of these policies. Um, okay, uh, so those are some to kind of give some specific examples of kind of what how I'm thinking about the idea of a um, of a pre commitment. Now here's where I'm having trouble. <laughs> so my thought was um, one of the areas um, where we're already seeing what I might consider a justice trade-off um, is in the context of, wow, we need to rapidly deploy industrial scale renewables 
we have to make sure we don't get caught up on in NIMBYism and local land use approval, et cetera. We've got to, we've got to expedite um, this. And, it, and it's driven by exactly kind of what I was thinking about when I approached this chapter, which is there's all kinds of sense of emergency and urgency related to climate change. Whether it is this idea that we're in a climate emergency and adopting mitigation measures is so urgent, right? That we have to sacrifice everything else to get there. Or it's an actual, we've just had a disaster, right? And we're trying to, we're in, we're trying to deal with it. Um, so I took a look at New York's um, New York's expedited renewables um, uh, citing, um, citing law. And, it, and there are two pieces of it. So there's a part of it that, it, that creates what's called a build ready program. And that's a program where um, NYSERDA, the, the New York agency comes in and basically identifies areas it thinks are good candidates to host um, large renewable energy projects. And it kind of gets them all the way through permitting and ready, tees them up. Um, for a developer to come in and, and take them the rest, um, the rest of the way. And what you can see here is that there's definitely a lot of gesturing toward justice, right? There's a lot of, there's discussion of justice. I don't think it's particularly meaty and I definitely don't think it's a pre-commitment. So uh, NYSERDA, the statute says that one thing, one consideration may include the potential impacts of a development on environmental justice. And NYSERDA is directed by the statute um, to screen, to look at what environmental justice um, uh, impacts might be. Um, but there's no, it, it, you know, it, it's quite loose in the sense that even the statute is enshrining this kind of, well, you should look at it. You have to look at it. You may include consideration of it, um, but it's not a particularly strong um, protection. Um, there is a directive in the statute for NYSERDA to look at workforce training um, and green job development with special attention to environmental justice communities. There's no associated funding. I mean, this feels like something that's just has the potential, right? When we have agencies that are strained, running to keep up, to keep bridges built, to keep dealing with recurring floods, whatever, um, it, it doesn't feel uh, like a particularly um, strong statutory anchor to make sure that we're going to be attendant to this going forward. The other piece is permitting. So this is private developer identifies a, a project area for large scale renewable and wants to move forward. So, and the basic move that happens there is that under prior law, um, environmental, that these types of projects would be governed by New York's environmental review projects process and require consideration of environmental um, uh, in, uh, justice impacts. Um, they are now exempted. Um, and what happens instead is, is that the um, Office of Renewable Energy Siting requires that if you are submitting one of these proposals, you have to submit, and this is for regulation. The statute doesn't mention justice at all with respect to permitting. Through regulation, the agency has said, well, when you submit an application to us, you should include an appendix that talks about environmental justice and it, and it lists some things that you should include, but there's no command really to, um, uh, to consider it. So I guess, oh, oh sorry, ah, sorry. <laughs> I guess what I'm struggling with there is what to make of the expedited siting regime from the perspective of my idea about pre-commitments to justice. And, and I wanted to start by saying, I do think here there's a justice trade-off that's spurred by mitigation urgency. There's a, clearly a reduction in participation. Um, and this is just a slide to kind of emphasize that, you know, participation and meaningful involvement is a core, um, uh, is a core value of environmental justice. So even if you think at the end of the day, the outcomes, the projects that are built, that so there's not going to be, there aren't going to be substantive disproportionate impacts on environmental justice communities, you would still have to recognize that, that there's um, a, a harm related to, or at least a trade-off related to um, the reduced participation. Um, is it, I do think that there's room in the statute that we may end up with, you know, is there a possibility, there's nothing in the statute that would prevent disproportionate impacts to my mind um, on uh, disadvantaged or environmental justice communities. Um, I will say, 
I think at the end of the day, it's not a huge risk that that will happen for a variety of reasons. Um, one is most of these projects just aren't going to fit in the in the kind of um, the, the scale. They're mostly going to go upstate, right, which is not where a lot of our traditional environmental justice communities um, are. I think in New York State, um, there are a lot of people who take the view that rapid renewables deployment is overall better for EJ communities um, because it will reduce climate harms to which they are especially vulnerable um, and lead to the faster retirement of fossil fuel facilities that tend to be disproportionately located in those communities. Um, I think there's also kind of this sense that, gee, we don't think renewable facilities are bad for communities. We actually think they might be good. So there's, I, I think part of what's going on here is that people, there's a sense that the trade-off isn't a particularly big one because people aren't particularly substantively worried um, about, um, about bad outcomes. But I guess the question I would ask is, instead of kind of making it seem like we're being attentive to justice with these kind of gestures or references to it that don't have much bite, would it be better to just be explicit about we're not we're not going to include measures that have much bite because we don't think they're necessary to be more explicit about that um, uh, about that trade-off. Uh, but that's the piece I'm really struggling with and that I would really welcome everyone's um, uh, everyone's reaction to uh, in particular. Okay, so it, uh, I don't mean to jump in. So are, are we at a point now where we could get input for you? Excellent. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I would I would welcome thoughts and um, and questions. Great, wonderful. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. And just to remind everybody, if you have questions, please feel free to post them into the chat box or to the Q and A. Uh, Brad and I will try and and get them organized and presented so that everyone gets a chance to have an answer to their questions. Uh, of course. But uh, I will take the prerogative uh, as a, the moderator to ask one question to start, uh, which is just what a provocative idea and so many possibilities pop up. The problem is that uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many of them are too far afield for consideration for you, but some immediate ideas come up that, that this is a problem that other fields of law have had to tackle and solve. So uh, one of the ones I think you're immediately going to get asked about is uh, one way to make things very sticky and difficult to undo is to make them property. And to the extent that you can make it a vested individual property right so that government action to deprive it or limit it uh, requires a compensation, uh, that has been traditionally one of the most powerful ways to prevent uh, capricious government behavior. Uh, of course, that puts you into a very interesting, dangerous territory about how you might provide a, a economic valuation of environmental justice rights, <laughs> which uh, I'm not quite sure how to tackle that. So I, I didn't know if that was in the sphere of the sorts of things you were thinking about. Uh, from and I'll add one other one, so I get a twofer here, um, which is uh, you know, from an institutional perspective. The other way to try and make it sticky is to make the government authority implementing it as independent as possible. So to a certain extent, you know, the same way we have a social security trust mechanism to prevent political meddling, you know, is there a way to essentially create a trust that is freestanding independent from you know, political leadership to some extent without tripping constitutional boundaries? Uh, in the same spirit as well, is there ways to make the Office of Environmental Justice within EPA more independent with perhaps multiple bipartisan leadership that gets appointed, even though it's subject to oversight from the administrator. Just some ideas. Uh, I didn't know if those were things that you had looked at or thinking about or uh, in the sphere of what you're considering. But I will tell you that the make environmental justice values, private property subject to compensation never would have occurred to me. And I think I get stuck on, to my mind, I think about in the, in the I get stuck thinking in the climate context about um, uh, private property rights as an obstacle to adaptation because of the need to provide eminent domain when you're trying to do coastal use restrictions, et cetera, et cetera. It had not even occurred to me. And the only thing that I could think of that, and a, a failure of imagination, and I will try to explore that after <laughs> Casey and see where it takes me. But the only thing I, you know, when I was thinking about, is there anything stickier than a statute? I thought about, um, you know, the constitution and just felt it was a dead end. 
prospect that, the prospect that we were going to achieve. Now, it, it's a dead end at the federal level. Um, in New York, we do have a right um, to a clean and healthful environment. What's fascinating, though, is that um, there is a lot of hand-wringing consternation about the fact that, wow, now that we have that right in our constitution, is that going to slow down renewables deployment because communities, host communities are going to say that the proximity of the turbines, et cetera, violates their right to a healthy, uh, to a healthy environment. So there's some interesting tension, uh, tension going, going on there. Um, with respect to the institutional structure of the agency and giving it kind of protecting it from the political process. That is also fascinating. I had not thought about it. And I think the reason I it had not occurred to me is that something that I found a little bit troubling looking at New York's um, expedited siting process for renewables is that there's a fair amount of it that seems kind of it's a little bit condescending. So it gives ORES a significant amount of authority and they basically say, don't worry about it. We're gonna come up with reg minimum regulations for these facilities that make them safe for everybody. And then they're really limiting possibilities for public participation, involvement, judicial review and local control and saying, don't worry, we, we've got this. And, and to my mind, that is one of the real lessons from um, our experience in implementing environmental justice to date is that never works. And, and it, it, it's, it's, it's offensive. It, 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 it is, um, yeah, it, it's offensive to the communities in, involved. So it would not have occurred to me to give them more authority, although it is certainly in terms of thinking about um, stickiness post-disaster when you might have, because something I've struggled with is I say, oh, a statute is pretty sticky. Well, statute is pretty sticky until everybody's up in arms after a natural disaster and there's huge public outcry to change the law, right? And then it's not sticky at all. And then you're subject to the whims of the, of the majority. So that is certainly something that um, I think I should, I should give a little more attention to. Well, uh, yeah. It, but, before I pick up the thread and keep going with you on this, I, I do have a moderator's obligation at this point to pause. But Fred, I know that you need to post the CLE code at some point. Is now a good time to do that? Uh, already, uh, already done uh, through the chat box. Okay, excellent. So yeah, we, so, can, we, can, we can keep on going. So everyone who might have, might have their chat box open, if you need CLE credit for today's presentation, be sure to open the chat box, scroll back to the link, and make sure you get the code for use with your respective state authorities. Uh, also, I would remind everybody that we are not doing this in a presentation mode. This is actually a full-scale Zoom interactive session. So if you also want to just raise your hand and ask your question directly, that's also an opportunity. So uh, with, with that in mind, I also have to say, you know, I guess, two other another two-part question then. Uh, it seems to me that there's a very clear tension that environmental justice and a lot of other considerations go by the wayside immediately in emergency response. So is there a way to pre-design emergency response? Because a lot of these are based on templates that are actually in place in advance of a natural disaster so that you actually have thought through and pre-answered a lot of the conflicts you might see between environmental justice values and responding to an emergency. And second, in the same sort of context, um, one thing I might suggest since the overall project is a four degree C world scenario. Uh, I think one other likely tension that will arise as those temperatures and impacts start to develop is much stronger and accelerating interest in climate engineering and climate intervention, which raises a whole nother series of environmental justice issues. Because I, I feel pretty confident that when it's viewed through the lens of an emergency response, they will environmental justice values will get short shrift, if any. So uh, with that in mind, I just didn't know if there's some way you could think about pre-designing perhaps emergencies to avoid these issues. So I will say taking a step back, I think something that I need to do that is kind of lurking underneath all of my analysis but I haven't pulled out is that there, there is um, a bit of a difference between kind of um, the different emergency contexts I'm talking about. So there's um, immediate post-disaster um, is kind of one set of areas where, you know, we might be particularly concerned about um, uh, kind of trade-offs with justice. Another might be anticipatory um, emergency. So kind of we have to implement 
we have this incredible urgency to implement mitigation policy to get uh, shovels in the ground now because of what we, which is kind of a more chronic or longer, it, it's still, it feels it's emergency, but, it, but it's in a different, um, a different type. Um, and then also, so I guess maybe I need to sharpen, sharpen trade-offs, right? What are the trade-offs between and, and, and what are the contexts in which they're occurring? Um, and that might be really significant in terms of, um, and it had not occurred to me to think about um, geoengineering um, and I probably, and I should, right? <laughs> it, it, it does seem like it, and, and maybe that's what can motivate me in thinking about expedited renewables siting in some sense, that's an, an easy case because we, we tend to be a little, I mean, and I don't know if this is accurate. I, I, I'm not quite sure what to make of this. We have a tendency to think that the um, impacts on host communities of large scale renewables are, are not that bad. On the other hand, there are a lot of host communities that really hate them. And so that there's something, there's something going, um, uh, going on there, but um, certainly I can imagine the, the other area that comes up where the um, trade-offs with justice or at, at least siting of locally undesirable land uses might be more acute. Transmission lines are one, right? Um, and the other um, which could certainly be uh, geoengineering. I'm not even sure what that, I guess it depends what type of geoengineering you're talking about, what that looks like on the ground and for, uh, and for whom. Uh, but I appreciate um, the tip to look at that. And, and I do think if I, you know, continue to work on this project, sharpening the context in which trade-offs are happening is probably really important to understanding the best way to, um, if not prevent those trade-offs, at least make sure that they are occurring through their being surfaced, they're being discussed and recognized, um, and, and that there's some kind of um, process in place. So they're not, um, we're not just flowing down existing paths of inequality, right, um, as a default. And in fairness to you, it, it's probably not something that fits neatly within the specific topic of, of your chapter within the overall project, but perhaps with the overall environmental law collaborative, it might be it's something worth at least throwing into one of you know, the overall picture for it. Um, we also had a question posted, the question and answer session uh, from Randy Wynn, which uh, points out that there's actually a link between uh, anthropogenic global warming and actual warfare. Uh, so to a certain extent, you know, obviously the extent that we have climate change raising the risk of any kind of armed or uh, conflict, which then in turn enhances and exacerbates climate damage, uh, as we could see from the Ukraine disruption of fossil fuel usage and uh, the ramping back up of coal fire power plants in Europe. You know, if I could generalize the question slightly, uh, just does that mean that we also should best be thinking about in terms of pre-accommodation of environmental justice and other interest not only just in renewable project siting, but perhaps also in terms of when they're put into the context of national defense or strategic concerns. Uh, hey, I, I, it, I know that that's probably asking you to go a little bit outside what you're focused on your chapter, but it's a, a, it seemed to be an interesting question for the audience. Well, so absolutely, I'm focused, um, choosing to focus on climate law. Partly it's what I, what I know, partly it's an area where there's active lawmaking. And interestingly, where we're writing the laws now. A lot of the states that are writing the laws are concerned about justice. So they're making an effort um, to um, protect justice in their, um, in their statutes. When you have kind of pre-existing bodies of law and it's a matter of going back um, and uh, amending them, I think we're just not doing it in, in a lot of places. But ultimately, um, I, you know, any meaningful effort to, um, prevent impacts from climate change from um, just horribly exacerbating pre-existing inequality requires changes across a whole host of programs and statutes and um, and protocols and you know my little climate mitigation policy piece is is you know ultimately one tiny little um, little aspect of that. Um, and to give a for example, and now I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name of the author, but there's a, um, 
really wonderful article just published thinking about how um, climate change, climate change impacts and climate disaster uh, will really require us to rethink um, the structure of entitlement programs um, and talk about the ways that they are not working post-disaster right now. Um, and some of the coordination problems between jurisdictions and how all of those programs um, will need to be changed to function effectively in a climate changed world. And that's kind of, so um, I guess my hope would be that the thinking about this in a from a pre-commitment perspective is an orientation that could apply across a number of different statutes um, and subjects, even though I'm just focusing narrowly on the design of climate mitigation policy. Okay. Uh, wonderful. We have probably time for one more question. Uh, we've got close to 90 folks online. So just uh, giving folks a chance, one last opportunity, because I have to tell you, I'll ask another one. I was feeling really, really proud of myself for getting all of these folks here until I realized you all are doing CLE. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It, that is not true. Uh, it, it is not the CLE, but if it was an ethics program, that might be true. Uh, well, I, I guess uh, let me just raise one other question about the scope of the project you're doing, which focuses on renewable energy projects, which kind of seems to be the sharpest uh, disjoint between environmental justice values, but also the need to respond to climate change. Uh, I was curious whether or not that you, you you might see earlier indicators if you looked at things that are in the same zone, but are not exactly the same type of project. We're already seeing environmental justice pushback on carbon sequestration and the, uh, the attempts to incite injection wells near environmental justice communities. You know, the White House uh, Environmental Justice Advisory Group has already specifically pointed it to CCS as something that they do not support and as against uh, environmental justice values. Uh, to a certain extent, if you want to get a sense of the early warning indicators, I mean, to a certain extent, you might want to look at some of these other sort of grayer projects. Uh, I didn't know that's that something that you had thought about or considered. Well, something that did occur to me when I, when I said it, I'm actually not all that worried that... Um, large scale renewable energy projects in New York are gonna have significant substantive impacts on disadvantaged communities for, for all the reasons that I already talked about. Even though I do recognize that um, there is a cutting communities out of um, cutting, kind of cutting off participation or limiting it is in, an, is in and of itself a harm. My, but it did occur to me that part of the value of maybe pointing out the fact that we're talking about justice while not really protecting it in this expedited siting regime may be really important if we decide we're gonna adapt this expedited siting regime to other grayer um, mitigation um, deployment that starts to happen. And, and I, I, that the idea to think about um, carbon sequestration injection is, is a good one. I've been thinking in the back of my head about um, transmission lines, um, but in other words, let's not, let's before we cu cookie cutter paste this expedited siting regime onto grayer um, and, uh, and land uses that have um, more difficult impacts. Hey, 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 wait a minute. We talk about justice, but we don't really meaningfully protect it. Um, and this is not the approach we should be using if we have, we think there's a, a bigger threat of substantive on the ground negative impacts for these communities. Absolutely, I strongly agree. And I, and I, I suspect it will come even more into focus as carbon dioxide removal based on land use or ocean based. Uh, are going to start impacting community uh, uh, values or community operations. And Tracy, I have to say, I think you have just given me the concluding paragraph of my chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to, but I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> but it's also a nice way perhaps to finish up our call because our hour is up. So uh, once again, thank you uh, for a wonderful presentation and also for doing it from across the globe. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, with that, also, let me make sure I give uh, the mic back to Fred, because I know he would like to make announcements about our upcoming presentations. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for your great presentation, uh, Katie. Um, our next speaker will be uh, Professor uh, Sheila Foster for, from Georgetown Law, and uh, that's on uh, May uh, 20, the 25th. Excellent. And Over to I, you. Thank you. And Hopefully that'll be a nice way for everyone online. Thank you for joining us. And uh, our next session in May would might be a nice way for you to leap off into your summer breaks. So with that, thank you so much. We look forward to joining you again next month.